Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to another special live stream. And with us uh, here today, our dear brother, Dr. David Wood. And of course, I want to extend my welcome to all of you uh, globally. Uh, some of you are in Australia, some in Southeast Asia, some in Pakistan and India. And those of you who are in Europe, uh, as well as North America and the Middle East, I want to welcome all of you whatever your time zone is. Today's topic, of course, is very relevant to what's going on in the Middle East, uh, it, uh, specifically the conflict between Israel and Hamas. And uh, the reason why I titled it today as the Israeli-Islamic conflict is intentional, because oftentimes, uh, at least for myself, growing up all of my life in the Middle East, I've always been taught that the conflict has to do with the land and the conflict is political or geopolitical. But really, when you study the Islamic sources, it dates way back before even this 1948 event took place. And when I came to Christ and went all the way back to the Old Testament, I began to understand the position of the Jews in that region and the covenants between God and his people. All that to say is that there are so many ways you, look at, you can look at this conflict, but I want to put the spotlight on the fact that what Hamas did was religious first before anything else. With me here, of course, to uh, you know unpack uh, all of this and even present his own views. Uh, I'm not here to try to dictate my views on him, obviously, or any of my guests, but I'll be interested, of course, to hear about his take. And we're talking, of course, here about uh, David Wood. David, uh, welcome back, brother. It's always a pleasure to have you. And uh, it's been a while since mm -hmm. we did live stream together. Yeah, how you doing? I am doing fabulous. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep, I'd have to, I'd have to agree with you. Seems like it has something to do with religion here. Yeah. So I know you've done a number of things uh, on this, even in the past, before the conflict, you uh, did do like uh, clips. I, I was looking at some of the work you've done in the past, and now you've been interviewing uh, some people and you're doing some work on that with ap the apostate prophet. So uh, give us a glimpse of your take on what's going on right now. Uh, yeah, well, there, there are several there are several issues involved here. So one, you have uh, you had the the ongoing conflict, the well, you, multiple multiple things. So one, you have the conflict that's been around since uh, since Muhammad came along. Muhammad, the entire time he's in Mecca, so roughly the first twelve years or so that he's a prophet, he's assuring his followers, he's telling his followers, guys. If you're having any doubts about this, oh, wait till we wait till we get around the Jews. If we were around the Jews, the Jews would confirm what I'm saying. The Christians would confirm what I'm saying. They would recognize me as a prophet the moment they see me because it's so clear from their own scriptures that I'm a prophet, that a prophet was coming from Arabia and I'm him. I'm supporting them. They are going to love me and you're going to see it. You're going to see it, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to see it. And all his followers are, because, you know, they come from a pagan background. Um, they're all listening, going, wow, wow, this is going to be great confirmation. This is going to be awesome confirmation when the Jews affirm Muhammad as a prophet. And he's saying, he's telling us over and over and over again. And we're memorizing passages of the Quran revealed from Allah, telling us how the Jews will know this guy as soon as they see him. Uh, eventually, eventually. They leave Mecca, the Muslim community leaves Mecca, goes to Medina, where there are three Jewish tribes. And oh boy, now we got the test of all tests. Muhammad has been telling his followers, these are the guys who are going to confirm me as a prophet. And the Jews did what? They mocked him, laughed at him, thought he was a complete Jew. Are you serious? Are you serious? You're claiming to be an Ishmaelite from Arabia in our line of prophets. Are you nuts? Are you insane? And so he had put he had put a, quite a bit of confidence. Uh, into his followers that the Jews were going to confirm him as a prophet. The Jews rejected him as a prophet and, and mocked him uh, as the most obvious false false prophet they had ever seen. And that's what that's when all this ah we have to kill the Jews. The Jews are the enemies of the true Muslims. And then all of a sudden, the Allah's mind changes about the Jews. First, the Jews are like these uh, these authorities in matters of religion. In fact, in fact, you 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 know Surah ten verse ninety four where Allah tells Muhammad, when Muhammad's in Mecca, Allah tells him, hey, Muhammad, if you're doubting these revelations, because keep in mind, Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic in origin. 
Um, and it was his wife and her cousin who convinced him that, no, 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 you're actually a prophet of God. And so, but, but, uh, Muhammad, uh, had doubts initially he thought he was demon possessed and he had pe he had periods of doubt and was, eh, are these revelations really coming from god anyway allah helps him out and says muhammad muhammad if you're doubting these revelations just check with the jews and christians they'll confirm they'll confirm that these are these are the true revelations which is odd because uh the, the verse actually says muhammad um, if you doubt what we have revealed to you, ask those who are reading the book before you. So this is talking about Jews and Christians. So supposedly the big test, the big test of whether Muhammad is a true prophet, the big test of whether he really speaks for God is going to be uh, how the Jews react to him. And he gets there and they laugh at him and mock him. And it was horribly embarrassing for him. And all of a sudden, the Jews go from being this uh, this authority in matters of religion who had the ability to confirm or reject his revelations. And suddenly they become uh, the enemies of true believers who have to be uh, violently subjugated. Muhammad gave orders to his followers to ultimately expel not only uh, Jews, but also Christians from the Arabian Peninsula. And Muslims don't understand why, but think about this. The Jews and the Christians were the people who knew the book, who knew the book, and they could confirm or disconfirm him. He originally thought they were going to confirm him. Then they all laughed. They all they all laughed him, uh, laughed at him. And so you have to get rid of these guys. Now think about why does he want no Jews or Christians on the Arabian Peninsula and doesn't want Jews or Christians in other places unless they're completely subjugated to Muslims and aren't allowed to criticize him. What happened? This guy realized these are, these are the people who can expose me as a false prophet. I can't allow that to happen. So, so basically now you've got 14 centuries of Muhammad's followers trying to silence critics of Islam because it's so easy to expose him. So that's sort of one conflict that's been going on. And then you get the, uh, the uh, it gets renewed when the nation of Israel gets restored after World War II. And uh, and then, of course, even more recently uh, on October 7th. And, and these things all have different ideas behind them. But most recently, the October 7th attack, I think this is really connected to something that we're seeing in Dawa. We can see it in Dawa, but we know these guys are the Dawa. Guys, I mean, they admit it. I mean, they'll, they'll thump their chest and say, oh, Islam will conquer the world. But but we we know from their videos and from their talks and uh, from their lectures and so on, these guys are in a state of panic over what they call the avalanche of apostasy. So they know Islam is actually crumbling from within. Uh, we, uh, we just, me and AP just did a video. Um, it's estimated that between five and 10%, and this is, from, this is from several years ago, this statistic, it's estimated that between five and 10% of Muslims in Saudi Arabia are actually closet atheists. They don't, they don't believe. And that that's that holds true uh, across the Muslim world. It's estimated five to ten percent are actually closet atheists. You have underground churches and so on. Um, and people have looked; they've watched the apostasy rate among young people go from almost zero percent, roughly fifteen years ago, to twenty four percent, like five years ago. So it's gone from almost zero to twenty four percent. In just in just a few years, and they're looking at that. The Dawah guys are looking at that, but so are other Muslims in other parts of the world. They're looking at that and going, "Okay, if if the if the apostasy rate has accelerated that rapidly, what are things going to be like ten years from now? Is the apostasy rate going to be 50 percent, sixty percent? What is it going to be? It's going to it's going to crumble." And they know that when you end up with these ex-Muslims, whether the ex-Muslims become uh, Christians or atheists. Uh, there's a there's always a percentage. There's always a there's always a portion of those who become uh, active critics of Islam. And so wait a minute, we're getting all these new ex-Muslims. The apostasy rates are going through the roof, and the more the apostasy rises, the more critics of Islam we get. This is we're doomed. We're doomed here. If we if we just keep doing things the way we're doing, this all falls apart. Islam just completely falls apart here in a few years. So we have to do something right now. And so the Dawah guys are getting more aggressive, uh, but also M Muslim nations like Iran. Look at look at Iran. You you've probably seen the statistic where it's estimated that now now that forty percent of people in Iran actually believe in is consider themselves still Muslim. So you're talking that is Iran is now a Muslim minority 
country. It's a Muslim minority country. You're the religious leaders. You're looking at this. This We cannot keep going like this. To what, what, five years from now, then it's going to be like 30% of the population still believes in Islam? No, 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 no. And so they're all getting a very similar idea. We have to do something. We have to do it right now. We have to set things off. We have to get more aggressive. And you see, it's, 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 you know, groups like ISIS and, and other things that are going on, these are very different groups, but it's a similar mentality that's driving them all. The, the idea of ISIS was we need to, we really need to crack down. We need to crush all hypocrisy. We need to crush all heresy. We need to fully implement Sharia because if we don't, it's all falling apart. Look around us, it's falling apart. And so Iran has the same idea. They uh, they they work with uh, with Hamas. Everyone gets the same idea. We have to set things off with the Jews right now to try and rally Muslims into a into a state of uh, global conflict. Because other than that, we can't we can't just go out with a whisper and, and just fall apart. So uh, anyway, that's that's what's going on. That's the big picture of what's going on. Absolutely. And uh, on top of that, of course, um, if you look at the Quranic teaching about the Jews, uh, granted, you can see, you know, a couple of verses maybe that are favorable to them. But other than that, it's always negative, whether negative because the claim that God punished them because they turned their back on his covenants. That's in the past before Muhammad. Or now they are definitely uh, bad people because they have rejected Muhammad. And of course, you'll find some passages in the Quran where Muhammad was making his appeal to them. I mean, for instance, uh, you know, one of those passages, and I'm trying to find it here uh, in chapter five, verse 19. Um, uh, you know, it's saying this people of the book. Of course, this is a, a positive description of them. People of the book, meaning the Bible. Now there has come to you our messenger making clear to you many things you have been concealing of the book and affecting many things. In other words, it's almost like a laughable claim that somehow the Jews conspired with the Christians, conceal things in the Bible about the fact that Muhammad could be found in the Bible, even though the Jews don't care for Jesus of the, uh, the Christians, don't care for the Christians, can care less about what the Christians claim. And yet, for the purpose of antagonizing Muhammad, the claim, I've always been taught this, that they conspire together, head Muhammad, who is supposedly in the Bible. And you and I know, of course, how many passages in the Bible are taken out of context, applied to Muhammad, and the list can go on and on and on. But here's the interesting thing, uh, uh, David, and I tell people this, regardless of what any of our Muslim friends want to tell us about the conflict uh, between Hamas right now and Israel, regardless what many will tell us that, oh, what Hamas did really doesn't represent Islam. Okay, well, here's my question to my Muslim friends. Here is a hadith sahih, authentic hadith. Under a section in Sahih Bukhari that says, uh, basically, fighting the Jews. Here is what it says. Allah's messenger said, the hour, we're talking about the end times, the hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews and the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. So how in the world, David, can any Muslim look you in the eye and say that what Hamas did is un-Islamic when the prophet of Islam himself is commanding him to fight because the end time will not happen until this takes place? And uh, you can think about how that's connected to what I was uh, I was just saying. If you're a Muslim looking at how Islam is sort of crumbling from within and apostasy rates are going through the roof and the higher the apostasy rates get the more ex-muslims there are criticizing islam um me and ap just did a show talking about uh mbs so the, the crown prince of saudi arabia and he's legalizing alcohol in certain areas. He uh, he he made a, a bikini beach where now women can go around in bikinis. Of course, several years ago, um, made it legal for women to drive. But they're having all these con uh, all these concerts now with uh, people like Iggy Azalea, who was on stage uh, telling the crowd to worship her and things like that. And uh, they're, they're they're making all these rapid changes. If you're if you're a, a you know, a strict Muslim, you're looking at this going, how are Muhammad's prophecies going to be fulfilled that the Jews are going to be hiding from us? The Jews are already strong. You got, 
I mean, I mean, this is it, it's it's downright pathetic that you have you know two you've got one of the you've got the second biggest popular religious population in the world, two billion Muslim. There are fifteen million Jews on the entire planet. Uh, most of them, most of them in two areas, the United States and and Israel, but you've got 15 million Jews. You have two billion Muslims. For every Jew, there are over a hundred Muslims in the world, and the Jew and Israel's just more powerful. Like wh whenever the whenever the Arab nations would gather around and attack Israel, they they would get crushed. And you're looking at this saying. We're getting weaker. <laughs> How's this going to happen? How are we going to be running, running out the Jews, and the Jews are going to be running and hiding? How is any of this going to happen? And so, yeah, they're just a pan. I mean, it's like, it's like they're they're seeing what's. It, it's like they're they're realizing. Wait a minute, none of this makes sense right now. We're supposed to be on top. We're supposed to be the most powerful group. Uh, the Jews are supposed to be subjugated to us. The Jews are supposed to be running and hiding. We can't even get our we can't even get our virgins and so on until we deal with this Jewish problem. And we're getting weaker and weaker and weaker and falling apart. What do we got to do? Uh, we just got to set it off. And that seems to be the mentality. We just have to set it off and keep setting it off and and make it a global thing and and right. harass harass Jews wherever we find them. In uh, whether it's in a uh, in New York or or London, wherever you where, wherever they are, we have to go after them and try and set it off. It it really seems like some of these guys are just trying to bring out the end times because they think if they can't if they can't do this now, Islam's just going to fall apart and there's no hope that it's ever going to happen. That is true. And, and of course, they're frustrated uh, with Muslims also, not just with the Jews. They're frustrated with these Muslims. Like you said, they're either not living up to the expectations of what is a true practice of Islam, the seventh century Islam. That's why the groups like ISIS, for instance, and Hamas antagonize Muslims, first of all, not just Christians or Jews. And the second dilemma that they're faced with is that if we want to fulfill, like you said, the mandates of Allah or the prophet, we're losing power. We're losing people. And of course, there is this element of embarrassment, like you mentioned, the Six-Day War. This in, in the six days, Israel basically fought multiple nations, defeated them, and took over large swath of land. So it was it backfired because the idea was to fight Israel, uh, crush Israel, and take back the land. Israel ended up taking more land mm -hmm. as a result of this. Until this day, by the way, uh, the uh, the Arab uh, Arabs and Muslims can get over the fact that they will tell you Allah is punishing us because we're not really being good Muslims. And that's why groups like Hamas and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab and everybody else like that claim that they are the righteous ones who are trying to fulfill God's mandate. Now, you mentioned something interesting about, of course, uh, anti-Semitism. I mean, David, what do you say about people who are walking in the streets, who don't know anything about Hamas, don't even know what river they're talking about or which sea. If you show them a map, they won't even know how to point it to you. Where is this coming from? Well, you have, uh, I'll just say lots of college students are uh, morons. <laughs> it really looks like a, a lot of these uh, kids on college campuses, they've, they've grown up on TikTok and so on, but they've just become a uh, You've seen it. It's it's like people nowadays wake up and they're told what to be enraged about. Like what are what are today's marching orders for what I'm supposed to be enraged about? People have just been uh, they've clicked up with various groups and whatever they're supposed to be enraged about that day as part of their group, uh, they they just go along with it. And so they found out in October that what they're supposed to be enraged about is. Uh, is Israel. They're supposed to be enraged at Israel. And so this took off very quickly. It was, matter of fact, it was right after the attack. So this is bef before any sort of retaliation by Israel, even before Israel's going after Hamas, you had all these student groups at like Harvard who said that Israel is 100% responsible for the attacks. There's no blame on Hamas for the things that they were doing. And uh, so, you, you know, I, I, most people would think along the lines that you just brought up, what do these college students know about anything? And you find out, you say, hey, you guys are running around shouting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Uh, what river and what sea are that? And they have no clue. Oh, uh, I don't know, the Dead Sea? What is, oh, no. They don't even know what they're chanting for. So you're dealing with people who have absolutely no clue what they're talking about. Uh, they're completely clueless. So why are they out there uh, chanting at rallies 
and calling basically for genocide against Jews. That's what it is when you say from the river to the sea. Uh, that's wiping, making all of uh, Israel from the, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, just wiping Israel out and putting it all under the control of Muslims. Uh, why are they chanting that? They, and they don't even know what they're chanting for. You can ask them. They have no clue what they're chanting. What does that mean when they have no idea? It means they're just told to do this and they do what they're told. And so it, these, these sorts of things have combined. You've got the religious motivation within Islam, but you have various political movements that have aligned themselves with Islam here in the West, and you've got you've got millions of really dumb college students uh, who are just taking their orders, but they're taking their orders from this this you know leftist Islamic alliance. That interestingly, we started seeing it breaking down over LGBTQ issues. Looked like it was it was finally this alliance was finally breaking, but then there were some Jews involved, and so nothing unites these groups like uh, like uh, complaining about Jews. That is true. And, and it's really, you know, uh, heartbreaking to see uh, elite universities like this, where the uh, tuition cost is extremely high, higher than usual. And you don't have a uh, reasonable voice over there. Someone who has at least some logical uh, way of reasoning with the conflict. It's, it's okay to have a few uh, who are holding banners and, and saying things. But when you see that the majority of those students are doing this, and yet they don't have a clue what cause are they standing for. I mean, if they're really uh, against this idea, the claim that Israel is committing ge genocide, then what do they say about the historical uh, facts that in the Islamic traditional books, it stated that Muhammad did a genocide against one of the Jewish tribes? Yeah, and um, I mean, if you... However, you want to define that. I mean, yeah, he wiped out the Kareza Jews, and the, these were Jewish tribes that were in Arabia long before he came along. So they were there before he was. He comes. He comes along. Oh, and the the explanations for why he was doing it were ridiculous. He wanted he wanted to completely wipe out the first tribe of Jews because they pulled a prank in the marketplace. One of them uh, sort of uh, tacked down. A Muslim woman's dress, so that when she stood up, it, uh, it, you know, people saw her rear end. And Muhammad wanted to completely exterminate the entire tribe, but they, that tribe had some Arab allies, so Muhammad expelled them instead. Then the second tribe, he just, he just said, "Hey, you know, I got a revelation. They're conspiring against me. We have to get rid of them and take all their stuff." So he, you know, the, he keeps taking. Uh, well, the, the the first tribe took all their stuff, um, but then you get to the third tribe. And it's uh, supposedly they're trying to, they're, they're forming an alliance with the Meccans and so on. But what does Muhammad do? He completely wipes them out. Um, all the, every, every male who had reached puberty is wiped out. The women and girls become the, uh, the sex slaves. And the, the, the boys who hadn't reached puberty also became their slaves. And so if you wanted to call something genocide, that would be it. Uh, it's been pointed out. Israel could turn Gaza into a parking lot tonight if they wanted to. They could they could level the entire place if they wanted to. The population of Gaza has been exploding for decades. Uh, in other words, you look at you look at if you look at a chart of the population of Gaza, it's going through the roof. Generally, if you have a real genocide, like if you're talking about the Armenian genocide, and you look at the numbers of Armenia, the numbers plummet. Because that's what happens in a genocide. If you look at the number of Jews in Europe uh, during the Holocaust, the number of Jews plummet because there's a genocide going on. So we have to say if Israel is actually attempting genocide, they are the worst who've ever done it. They, they are the worst because the population of Gaza is uh, is skyrocketing. It's going through the roof. If the Jews are try if that's the Jews trying to genocide these people, they're they're doing a, a horrible job of it. And so the the term genocide is really, it's just it, it's really an insult. I mean, it's 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 just an insult to the Jews. Like, hey guys, you guys remember a genocide? So we're going to say you're doing that. We're going to call you Nazis and so on. And it's just silly. 
keep in mind, you can you can criticize things that Israel is doing, right? You can reasonably criticize saying, hey, they should have been more careful here because look at, you know, look, look at what they did when they bombed this area. Or, hey, look at what this soldier did. He killed that person who was waving a flag or something. You could, you could, you could have legitimate criticisms. But when you run around saying genocide is something that's obviously not a genocide, uh, it becomes clear that this is all part of a part of a is part of a rhetorical campaign. And so you've got uh, you've got you've got Muslims who are involved in this and who are willing to do pretty much anything to attack the Jews here. And they know you've got a bunch of morons on college campuses and you just tell them, hey, there's a genocide going on over there. And they go, oh, really? Genocide. Let's go out and rally. And so I don't know. It's just it's just kind of pathetic. But you see, Israel just keeps going after Hamas, which it's kind of what they have to do. Whatever else. It, so notice Israel a, after the attacks, Israel's got two goals. One, they got to get their hostages back. Uh, two, they got to deal with Hamas. That's it. And so they keep they keep uh, pursuing those goals regardless of who's complaining. So again, you can criticize specific things that that they're doing, but I'd say they're entirely reasonable trying to get their hostages back and trying to make sure Hamas uh, is never able to do something like that again. Uh, that is true. And also, you know, it, it makes me wonder, do these um, uh, supposedly in intellectual uh, students uh, have any opinion about the fact that Hamas has their headquarters under a hospital? I mean, who in the world will have a military headquarters under a civilian infrastructure or a building unless they have really bad intentions, knowing that if they try to hit us, they're going to kill civilians? And, and, you know, you hear it from many people, by the way, secretly, at least they don't try to publicize it. Uh, people who lived in Gaza uh, will tell you that the people in Gaza sometimes are tired of Hamas, but they cannot do anything about it. I mean, that's the sad reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, if, you, if you're living around Hamas, you're, you're not going to be complaining much about Hamas. If you're living around ISIS, you're not going to be complaining about ISIS, even if you absolutely, even if you absolutely despise them. And so uh, it, it's basically, look, uh, I mean, as far as like the perspective of, of, of Israel's concern, it's, it's basically, look, if you're in Gaza, uh, whether you support Hamas or not, um, they, they don't get to be leading, they don't get to be leading uh, a, a territory right beside us anymore because we've seen how they're going to do it. We're not just going to sit back and wait for them to do it again. We're going to, we're going to stop them. And so that seems like a, seems like a perfectly reasonable goal and it's it's interesting because after after the the october 7th attacks every time i would turn on the news the news would start be, be would the the news anchors would start talking about a proportionate response like israel's response has to be proportionate to what they had in other words if 1200 uh, israelis were killed in the attack then israel needs to like even the balance and make you know so you could go to kill Kill twelve hundred of them, but then you have to stop. You have to stop and and even this when the when the score is even, and that's just ridiculous. Like where 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 were they getting that? That is that is no one's concept of what you're supposed to do in a war. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the the response was not, oh, okay, let's go blow up an, an equal number of their ships. That's not your goal. That's not the goal of the U.S. government. That's not the goal of the military. That makes zero sense. If a bunch of your ships get destroyed, your goal in the war is making sure they are never capable of doing that again, or that, or that even if they are uh, technologically capable, that they would never think of doing that again. So it's not just it's not just evening a score; it's protecting your people and stopping people who want to harm you, making sure they can't do that. So if Hamas kills twelve hundred of your people, it's not oh let's go get twelve hundred of them and then we'll stop because then the score is even. Your goal as a government and as a military is make sure that group never does that again, is never capable of doing that again. And that would, since since it's that's the main objective of Hamas is to come and, and wipe out Israel, since that's their stated goal, uh, you have to take that goal seriously and say, okay. Hamas has to go. Hamas has to be has to be gone. We have to uh, we have to uh, we have to absolutely destroy Hamas so that they can never do this sort of thing again. And, uh, you know, uh, I hate to say it this way, uh, David, but uh, silence sometimes can send a message. Notice uh, how many of the uh, Arab countries around Israel are saying we want to welcome the Gazans to us. Nobody is doing that at all. And second of all, 
uh, yeah, sure, th there are some statements that are coming out uh, about, oh, we're against this or against that. And uh, sure, you know, we don't like what Israel is doing. But at the end of the day, I guarantee you that many of them are just excited that Hamas is being annihilated simply because Hamas creates problem for everybody. I mean, how come the Egyptians are not willing to take them? They're right at the border. Yeah. And, you know, it's a. Uh... It's been pointed out many times. Look, there there are Christians in uh, more so in the West Bank, but there there are still Christians in Gaza. There are Muslims who who would like to live their lives and raise their families and not have to get Absolutely. bombed, not have to get bombed, and so on. And so, it's uh, notice it's it's partly for their sake as well. Like you can actually you can actually uh, empathize with those people and say, hey, what you know, exactly. we we need to help these people, but. Uh, right. And so you could actually criticize Israel on on along those lines, and hey, you know, hey, when you guys are doing your your counter strikes and so on, there are, there are people there, and Israel does take steps like warning people uh, when they're going uh, when they're going into a territory and so on. But um, yeah, there are people there who want no part of this conflict and would like to live normal lives. But guess what? That all the more we should be rooting for Israel to wipe out Hamas because it would, I don't know, I'd like to, I'd like to see people in Gaza be able to live uh, normal lives. Um, but it, that, that cannot happen when you have Hamas pulling the strings. It just can't. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're only, they're only two speeds for Hamas. You're either attacking or you're preparing to attack. That's all they do. They attack or they prepare, they attack, they prepare, but the goal is always wiping out Israel and you're just not, you're not going to have a, you're you're not going to be able to have a normal life in an area like that because they're always going to be doing something. You you can you could spend a decade building up Gaza and then Hamas is going to go attack Israel and everything you've just done is going to get bombed down to nothing. And so yeah, gotta gotta deal with Hamas. That's the that's the primary thing that needs to be done. And mm -hmm. uh, and if we really want to deal with it long term, we have to expose Islam uh, and and shake people's confidence in Muhammad because then they won't be so inclined to. Uh, to be obsessed with fulfilling his prophecies about wiping out the Jews. Right. And of course, uh, not to mention that uh, Hamas and UNRWA are working together, the UN Organization oh, yeah. for uh, Relief. I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm, I mean, when you listen to reports, I laugh. It's like, you know, I could have told you this a long time ago. Uh, so, but, but, you know, here's the thing, uh, David. Uh, still, the West somehow is in denial. They keep talking big about Hamas and everything else, but they're still not trying to publicly, I should say, publicly tie Islam and its teaching to what groups like Hamas are doing. Do you think this would change? Um, wait, what, what, what part? What part would change? Like if uh, the West, the, the these uh, governments, uh, mm -hmm. finally will publicly begin to connect. That Hamas is doing what they're taught to do from yeah. their own sources. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think I, I think I think we could a, achieve some some greater peace, at, at least in what we've had, you know, in, in the past past in recent decades. If you didn't have a bunch of morons in college campuses and didn't have a bunch of politicians and journalists. Uh, making Hamas think that if they just keep going, they could win, right? So if you're Hamas and you go and you kill uh, 1,200 Israelis, that's your most that's the most successful thing you've ever done as your group. Uh, and you're thinking, wow, that's way that's way more than we were able to do 15 or 20 years ago. You have to be thinking at this point, ooh, what if we keep getting funding? What if what if people keep supporting us? We could actually win this. And if they think, okay, we're getting we're getting bombed, uh, our tunnels are getting blown up. Uh, this doesn't look like it's going our way, but we've still got all this support from all these nations and all these young people on all these college campuses are supporting us. I guess we just have to keep going. Maybe we'll eventually, maybe we'll eventually win. If that, if that shifted, if college students stop being so moronic that they're, I mean, supporting Hamas, I mean, you're supporting Hamas, you morons, you're supporting Hamas. If you, if they stopped it, and Western nations stop supporting organizations that are actually involved with or or are funding terrorism. If if everyone just stopped and instead sent them the message, guys, there is no scenario where you defeat Israel. It's not going to happen. Give it up. It's never going to happen. This this from the river to the sea. It is a complete fantasy. 
it, you are you are completely deluded. Stop it. Stop embarrassing and humiliating yourselves because you're you're fake prophet. Stop doing that. Then I don't know. Maybe if you got rid of Hamas and people absorb the idea, okay, this is just this is just a hopeless a hopeless goal uh, that we're going to go out and destroy Israel's what massively more powerful than us. If they if we got them to get rid of that idea, they they might just say, okay, well, why don't we focus on actually building up our area and living normal lives and not trying to go out and, and kill the Jews? Absolutely. I mean, uh, there are some intellectual Arab minds, but yet, sadly, uh, these actions by people like Hamas end up suppressing those uh, voices, suppressing these talents. And that's why many of them migrate and leave the area. Now, uh, as you know, of course, the uh, Abraham uh, or the Abrahamic uh, 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 accord that took place uh, uh, during the uh, at least three to four years ago during the uh, Trump administration, uh, that there, there was another, uh, you know, basically country, Saudi Arabia, who was on the verge of signing such a normalization uh, of relationships with Israel. Well, now, what do you think is going to happen, uh, David? I mean, what is your take on the fact that it, it's going to happen? I mean, I'm pretty sure it will. Uh, the reaction to that, because that will be devastating. This is the heartland of Islam, the country where Islam emerged from, now normalizing a relationship, politically speaking, with Israel. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a that would be a huge step forward for Muslim nations, especially Saudi Arabia, to recognize, wait a minute, Israel's here to stay, and we need to live with it. And this seems to fall into the general pattern that... Uh, that you know the, the crown prince MBS is uh, has has been showing. He's trying to modernize his nation, and part of that would be not being obsessed with uh, destroying Israel. And so that would that would be a huge step. But Hamas and Iran noticed that. Right. In other words, wait a minute. Hey, uh, Saudi Arabia and possibly some other Arab nations here are all going to normalize relations with Israel. If that happens, wow, our goal of destroying Israel is going to be severely, severely weakened because now Israel is going to have like possible allies in the area. That's not Muslim allies. That, that's not going to work. So this was part of the goal. I talked earlier about, hey, we need to set things off now because we can't wait. So one, they can't wait another five or 10 years, just given what's happening and the apostasy rates going on, going through the roof. But they also can't wait five or 10 years uh, if if during those five or 10 years, the Muslim world is going to become okay with Israel and have relations with Israel. We can't let that happen. So we have to set it off now. So part of their goal, like they, they know it, they know, Hey, if, if, if we go in there and we kill a bunch of Israelis, there's going to be this massive um, response. Buildings are going to get leveled. Tons of people are going to get killed. They're aware of all that. They know that. Uh, but that was, that was the goal. They understand, wait a minute, we go in there and kill a bunch of people they're going to be bombing us in response. They're going to end up killing a bunch of Muslims. And that would be a really, really bad time for Saudi Arabia to step in and say, hey, we're normalizing we're normalizing relations with Israel because there would be a, a massive global outrage against them from uh, Muslims. So that's that's all that's all part of the plan. But when things die down, um, you know, hopefully Israel can uh, deal with Hamas, get their hostages back. And uh, I don't know. I'd like to like to see. Uh, I'd like to see Muslim nations getting along with uh, with Israel. So, but yeah, we'll have to see. But it would it would follow the pattern that that uh, Saudi Arabia has been. It would follow the trajectory. That that is true. That is true. And of course, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see some of the reactions of the hardliners because they still have some religious hardliners. But mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, it's it's a huge step forward by a nation that represents Islam. It's the face of Islam. Sure, Iran is going to try to capitalize on that and try to, uh, you know, lobby uh, and ask Muslims to turn their back, you know, uh, on uh, a Saudi and try to show them, see, we are the keepers of Islam. That's why we fight Israel. But I think uh, people are starting to get tired of it. You know, just like ISIS, uh, you know, when they are, uh, they, when they have this, their, uh, you know, caliphate uh, per se, Many of the youngsters got tired of the image of Islam that was so embarrassing. They began to see on social media what ISIS is doing, and mm -hmm. they began to connect the dots. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I did read that Muhammad did things like this. Now I can see it. And mm -hmm. it was disgusting. So I mm -hmm. think this is yet another step, like you mentioned earlier in the show, that will help uh, at least many uh, Muslims, especially the young generations, to 
leave Islam, hopefully coming to Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, even before, even before the rise of ISIS, there were there were uh, polls among young people. Uh, so this before ISIS, uh, but in Iraq, the younger generation of Muslims that were growing up were saying they they despised religion because they viewed it as the source of endless conflict and bloodshed, and they'd seen that with their own eyes. So this was the younger generation before isis then isis takes over and they get to see islam in all its blood spattered glory and you know then those those uh those young people are are growing up and of course now they're they're seeing what hamas is doing and so on so yeah uh iran hamas these groups may think uh you know this is our last chance we really have to do it but and and it's going to it's going to work with certain people we've seen lots of people um, who get really riled up anytime Jews are mentioned and, and that hostility is still can still be there and they can sort of uh, flip out anytime anything involves Jews. But uh, there are going to be lots of other young Muslims who are looking at all this going, wow, all these critics of Islam who keep, who keep saying that all this violence has something to do with our religion looks like they're right. And uh, yeah, I think we are going to see a lot more ex-Muslims uh, as a result of all this. And so one of the, this is going to be a, this is going to be a huge backfire for them. Absolutely. Well, brother, uh, we're almost wrapping up uh, this live stream. Uh, tell us a little bit more about anything new that you're working uh, on in terms of like videos or anything you want to announce here uh, to people where they can find you. I know you have at least one, maybe two channels now. Yeah, I got a got a couple channels, but um, yeah, uh, AP and I go live pretty much every Saturday and Sunday, and also some some other times during the uh, during the week. We're about to head over to Israel to uh, meet with some uh, meet with some friends over there and do some interviews and record some videos. So that should be fun. Wonderful. I was going to go to Israel, but unfortunately, because of this conflict, they ended up canceling the trip. So hopefully. They will uh, open up the uh, trip again soon. Well, brother, um, as always, uh, thank you so much for uh, all that you do. And uh, I encourage people, of course, to subscribe to your channel. Can you uh, kindly mention uh, about the name of your channel in case somebody doesn't know about it? Uh, again, a couple of them. But uh, uh, for apologetic stuff, then go to Apologetics Roadshow. Yeah, and that's the one that I typically end up seeing, uh, mm -hmm. and that's the one I think you and AP appear on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going, by the way, I mean, uh, I did mention that to you in the past. I'm going to have another channel just for political reasons, and probably I'm going to go to Rumble uh, for that. Uh, so I will be talking uh, politics over there. Well, brother, uh, thank you again. Uh, it's exciting, of course, times, and, uh, you know, hopefully... Uh, that uh, one day we will be talking about the fact that many Muslims have left Islam and maybe even uh, most of them uh, found Jesus as the answer uh, to the to the problem. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you so much, of course. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, for any more information about, uh, um, you know, David's channel, I'm going to put the link for you guys in the description box so you can go and check it out and subscribe to it. All right, brother, take care. And I hope to see you again pretty soon here because I would love really to start doing more and more regular uh, live streams with you. Mm -hmm. Everybody, this is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless. Take care.